Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. That thing's pretty heavy. So last week I shared a video around the misconceptions around UI design grids. Over 13,000 views, so obviously you guys liked it, but some of you guys asked that critical question of, okay, if we don't have UI grids, then how do we design consistent layouts for our UI designs? Like what is that alternative? So in this video, we've got a whiteboard. So we're actually going to dive into Twitter, reverse engineer what Twitter has done, we're gonna take that concept onto the smart board so I can help break it down a little bit further. Then we're gonna take that understanding and bring it over into Figma so you understand how you can design complex, responsive, dynamic layouts for UI design without strict grids, okay? So, without further ado, let's dive into it. Now, as you guys can see, we have Twitter over here, world-class social platform that I don't really use much anymore because I got a little bit tired of tweeting anyways. Let's take a look at what they've done. They've got a left sidebar, they've got some content area, and then they've got a right sidebar on the right hand side. So let's dig into the actual code itself and see what's actually happening. Oh, and by the way, if you are interested in mastering Figma and UI design and some of these technical concepts, make sure to check out my Figma Masterclass course. We cover all of this in detail and you can also learn in your own time as well. We've nearly got over 4,000 students that have taken on this course, five star reviews, so make sure to check the link in the description. Back to the video. So if we go ahead and take a look at what they've actually done, if we take a look at the sidebar on the left hand side, we can see, right, in the actual code itself, the width of this sidebar is 275 pixels wide, okay? So if I change this to 400 pixels, you can see that it just increases the width of the sidebar. So if I change it back to 275, you can see that's the default state, okay? So 275 pixel sidebar. Then if we take a look at the actual content area, right? We can see that the content and the right sidebar are wrapped inside a container, right? Because if we could see here, it wraps it. And if we click onto the actual container, we can see that there is a width of 990 pixels, okay? So we have a sidebar that's 275, a container, that's 990. And if we dig a little bit deeper into how they've actually structured this layout, we can see that they are using this thing called Flexbox. If you see this Flexbox or Flex Grow or Flex Direction in the code base, you understand that they are using one of the latest CSS advancements, in other words, the language that they use to build web pages and the styles and whatnot. They're using this concept called Flexbox. And we, if we take a closer look, they're using an attribute called justify content space between. Hmm, doesn't that sound a little familiar? Space between. It seems like we've also got that in Figma as well. So you don't need to understand exactly how Flexbox works, but this will hopefully give you a better understanding. Now if I turn off space, uh, space between, Right, if I hide that, you can see that immediately the gaps between the content area and the right sidebar disappears. If I increase it, I turn it back on, you'll notice that space between creates space between the two components, the content and the right sidebar. Now for this to actually work, you have to make sure that with the container itself, so I've, con I've uh, highlighted the container, you have to have a width, right? You have to have a width of 990 or whatever measurement you want. And then what you need to do is you need to then go ahead and define a width for the two containers inside. If you take a look at the, the container for the content, it has a max width of 600 pixels, okay? So the furthest, the widest it can get is 600 pixels. Then the right sidebar, right, as we see over here, has a width of 350 pixels. So what actually happens? So let's dive into the whiteboard and let's bring this over. And I'm just gonna make sure that you can actually see what I'm doing, okay? So let's just bring the actual camera closer. There we go. All right, so well, let's recap. We have a left sidebar that is 275 pixels. And then we've got a container, right, over here that wraps the content and then the right sidebar as well. 
and that is 990 pixels. Okay? So that to that. We then have a container for the content, which is 600 pixels, max width. So the, the widest it can get is 600 pixels. Then on the right hand side, we have a, a right sidebar of 350 pixels. So what Twitter has done, at least for the designers and the developers, we know that this is fixed. That's pretty easy to solve. This content area is 990 pixels. This we know is 600. This we know is 350. So technically, when we used to traditionally use strict grids where we have but the margin, set margins, set gutters in between each column and everything is strict, here we technically don't need that because we don't need to define this is what this uh, width is going to be because the, the browser right, already knows that the view, this viewport is 990. 600 plus 350 is going to be 950, okay? So this content area, right, this content area and this content area, whoops, is going to be 950, okay? Then nine, so 990 minus 950 is going to be 40, right? So 40 pixels is going to be here. Without you having to tell the browser that this gap is 40 pixels. It's going to be 40 pixels because that is the only room that is left once you have a container that's 600, 350 inside a container of 990. So hopefully you're starting to understand how we can create flexible layouts without having to set strict column widths and gutters and margins and all this stuff because with the advance of CSS, which is the language that developers use to style and build uh, web pages and build web layouts, we can use a con the concept called CSS Flexbox, right? Flexbox. And it's really important about, you have to understand Flexbox because this concept of space between, right? Creating that space between these two components allows us to utilize this type of stuff. And that is why Figma also has the concept of space between to replicate what CSS Flexbox has to offer. So there is a link in the description. If you want to learn a little bit more about Flexbox, you can read about it. It will help, definitely help you understand how this translates into... Who's that? Yeah. All right. So, so hopefully you understand that. We're going to now go ahead and take this understanding and we're going to jump into Figma and help you understand how we can practically apply it into Figma. Now let's go ahead and rebuild this. So we have a left sidebar that's going to be 275 pixels. So hit F on my keyboard, I'll draw down a frame, and I'll make sure that this is 275 pixels. And then I'm going to hit Shift A and to turn it into an auto layout component because I'm going to be putting in some information into it. And then I'm going to make this uh, called the header, right? It's the sidebar, but it's also called the header in Twitter's uh, markup. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Command D and bring this across. And I might just give this a background color actually. I might just give them a background color just so you can see the difference uh, between all the different uh, columns. Okay, so we've got some, some color going on, right? Beautiful. Now remember, the content area, there's a wrapper around the content and the right sidebar. So it's going to be 990 pixels. So let's go ahead and make this 990 pixels, 990. And I'm going to keep this as uh, fixed for now, okay? So inside this wrapper that we're going to call main, I'm going to go ahead and drop another auto layout inside to create this section, the max width of 600 pixels for the content area. So I'm going to hit Command D, drag main into main, and then we're going to call this, uh, let's just call it content for now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this 600 pixels fixed, okay? Now after that, I'm going to go ahead and hit Command D, duplicate the content area, and I'm going to make one that's going to be 350 pixels. Okay, so 350 pixels on the right hand side. Now select, I'm going to select my main just to make sure that everything is uh, stacked horizontally, and I'm going to go ahead and just uh, create some color so you guys can see the color. Now the last thing we need to make sure that we're doing is once we select our main, we want to keep, click on the three dots, space mode space between, right? As you can see, immediately it pushes the right sidebar to the right, and if I scale this uh, larger or smaller, it's always going to be pushing that content to the right because we have 
set it to space between, which is a CSS flexbox attribute. Now I'm just gonna quickly go ahead and just make sure that all my containers are set to a fill container, right? So just fill the container uh, vertically just so they don't uh, collapse later. And I'm just gonna make sure that this main container is just sitting inside the actual uh, viewport of the browser. All right, looking good. So let's understand this section, the left sidebar. Let's pop in back into Twitter and I'm gonna quickly show you if I hop onto the sidebar, there are these green bars on the left and right. And what does that actually represent? If we take a look into the code, it represents padding left and padding right is 12 pixels, okay? As you can see, there's uh, 12 pixels on the left and 12 pixels on the right. So what we can do is for the header, we can change this to 12 pixels on the left and right and also add 12 pixels on the top and bottom. And then we can just make sure that this is set to fixed height. And then also let's make sure that we set this to fixed width because remember the width is set as 275 pixels. So I'm gonna go ahead, T on my keyboard and now I can put down a logo, right? And then we might also duplicate that, just make the font size in 20 and we can just go ahead and replicate our side menu. So home and explore, right? So we can go ahead add some navigational elements, boom, 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 boom. And then we can also turn one into a button maybe, change that to fill container, fill, and we can just make that black and then make the text white inside. And as you can see, we immediately pretty much have replicated Twitter's sidebar, all right? Now, as you can see in the, in the content area, right, we have this main container. And you'll notice that if you look really closely, everything, the layout inside this uh, main con content area flushes all the way to the left and to the right. But then each cell or each content block inside the container has a bit of spacing on the left and on the right. As you can see, there's a, it doesn't touch the borders, okay? But if you take a look, once if we don't hover on anything, the actual containing box does touch the sides, right there, right there, okay? So for us to replicate that, what we need to do is on the main, we need to make sure that there is no padding on the top and bottom, right? So everything is flush to the, the top and the sides. And then for the content, we also want to make sure that there is no spacing on the top and bottom, right? No spacing. So if we hit F on our keyboard and, and then draw a box inside, right? A content block and make sure it is filling the container all the time. And I'll just add in uh, just a little bit of color just so you can see. I can then go ahead and turn this into an auto layout component, change this to maybe post box to replicate this uh, box at the top where we're gonna post our tweet. And I can actually go ahead and put in some text, home, and then we can duplicate that, call, uh, use what's happening. And then we can also change this uh, vertical to vertical, and then we can also add a little profile photo, auto layout that, bring that over, and we are already replicating, as you can see, the actual Twitter box up here, right? So you can notice that if I duplicate this post box and make, imagine these are tweets and just remove the padding to zero, you can see that these tweets now replicate these ones. And if I was to ever extend it, it will always stay max width of 600 because this is set to 600 and fixed. However, if we wanted to make sure it scales all the time, we can change this to fill container and you'll notice that as we expand, it'll always expand and collapse. But we're trying to replicate what Twitter has done. Now, as you can see, we technically don't need any strict grids to create these responsive and dynamic layouts. Now, you might be wondering, okay, well, if we do something like this, how do we hand this over to developers? How do, we, how do they know what should be the measurements for the padding? How do they know it's 12 pixels or 16 pixels? So this comes back to a concept called spacing tokens, which I mentioned in the previous video. So if we take a look at the spacing that Twitter has used, on the left and right hand side, we can see that they are using padding of 12 pixels. If we take a look at the actual box over here in the content area as well, I just quickly find that uh, space, you can see that this, this box right here next to the avatar, there is a margin right of 12 pixels, right? Another, once again, 12, right? Or divisible by four. If we take an, another look at some more measurements right here, the left and right where the green lines are, we have padding right and padding left of 16 pixels. So we can assume that Twitter is following the very common uh, framework of the four point grid system. So this can then be translated into something called the spacing tokens. 
So spacing tokens is a really simple concept to grasp. So let's just say one spacing token is equivalent to four pixels. And then two uh, spacing tokens would be equivalent to eight pixels, then so on. So three would be 12, four would be 16 pixels, and so on and so on. Now, it's a little bit convoluted if you are going to be using one, two, three, and four to define how much space it's going to be. So some companies, instead of using numbers, they use words. So depending on the different company that you're working for, there'll be different naming conventions. So this could be, for example, spacing extra, extra, extra small, right? Then the second one might be spacing dash extra, extra small. Then you might have spacing dash extra small. And then for the fourth uh, unit of measurement might be spacing dash uh, small, and so on and so on. So when you actually go ahead and design this layout that Twitter has created, you don't need grids because this auto layout component has already defined all the measurements by 12 padding left and right. This one also has 16, whoops, this one should be 16. So we can change this to 16 and change all these to 16 as well. And then when you hand this actual, uh, this actual design over to uh, Twitter developers or to your developers, you just have to def tell them that this fixed sidebar for a desktop view is always going to be 275 pixels. This container that wraps all the content inside is always going to be 990 pixels. This content area is going to be 600 pixels. This right sidebar is going to be 350 pixels. In other words, we, if we use Flexbox to create this layout, they will know that, whoops, it will be 40 pixels. Let's just go, whoops, ah, where's my little highlighter? 40 pixels, right, for the space in between. They don't need to calculate that because Flexbox will calculate that for them. And then when they're building out the UI elements, you can always refer to your design system or your style guide and refer to the spacing tokens that you have defined. So if we were to create spacing for this sidebar on the left-hand side, it would be 12 pixels. So you would just tell them spacing dash x extra small would be the spacing that you want to utilize in the sidebar. So hopefully this gives you a better understanding of how you can design your wine without the need of strict grids. Now obviously, different projects require different requirements and have different expectations. You might be working on a project where you do need strict grids. And then you may be working on projects that don't require strict grids because the developers are using CSS Flexbox and they are also using spacing tokens, which means that sometimes you might not need that strict grid in the actual design. However, with that being said, sometimes within Flexbox environments, you can add strict grids into specific sections. So maybe just in the content area, you might want to go ahead, add a grid, right? You might go ahead, add some columns. You might give it eight columns. The margins on the left and right might be 16, and you might create a gutter of 20 pixels, right? And you might use a little bit of a, gr a strict grid inside this component just to keep things aligned. There is no one way to utilize grids in UI design, but hopefully this video gave you a little bit more of an understanding of how some more advanced, more senior designers utilize grids or don't use grids in their workflow. So if you have any questions, make sure to ask them in the comments below. If you like this video, make sure to gently smash that like button. For the diehard fans, make sure to subscribe and also turn on that bell notification. That's it for today. I'll see you guys in another video very soon.